Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Good morning. My name is Nathan Campbell. I serve as minister on staff in the Village Church Institute, where I primarily oversee our men's Bible study. Our text for this morning is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not your extorning, uh, adorning be external, the braiding of your hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, the clothing you wear. Let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is the word of the Lord. Anyone nervous for me? Anybody? A couple of you? Okay. There are chunks of scripture over the last two millennia that have been removed from their context and used to beat up and and to malign and to harm. And this is one of them. This passage is a beautiful passage in its context. It is a hopeful passage in its context, and it is a life-giving passage in its context. It it actually would beckon women to leave abusive situations, not to stay. And where this passage has been twisted to harm you, like if you've grown up in a house where as a little girl you saw uh, a domineering and abusive father, I, I'm sorry. I, I hope that the Holy Spirit will, will minister to you today and maybe heal some of those pieces. Anyone who's ever used this passage to imprison a woman in, into a place where she has to keep her mouth shut while she gets beat up is way outside of the heart of God and the truth of this text. 
And, and even you, you can see what happens. You pull this out of you pull this out of its context. Now, can you understand kind of that that rural Pentecostalism that makes you wear a long dress and you can't braid your hair? Because I know we were reading the passage. I saw some of you like, uh oh, wrong day, you know, wrong day for this. And, and yet, rightly put in its context, uh, I think that that this passage not only protects women and children but literally is a seed that went into the ground that led us to this moment where women are seen as fully human. You can find pockets where they're still treated like they were in the first century under the, what's called the, the paterfamilias, which we'll talk about here in a second. I know you're eager for that. Um, but, but for now, you just need to hear me say, I know that this passage for many of you in a very real way might trigger something primal and something really hurtful that's happened in your life in the past or might be happening right now. And, and I want you to know that I'm, I'm in no way being cavalier but by trying to approach this passage and be faithful to it. But you cannot, the reason why we do things as a church, like the training program and like the classes that we have, is so that you might read rightly the word of God and be shaped by it rather than the kind of strange evangelical way of doing it, which is cherry picking verses that, that fit your own compulsions. And, and this says something. It can't say what you want it to say. It actually says something, right? right? It's not like, what does this text say to you? Stop asking that question. The text doesn't say squat to you. The text says something and then the Holy Spirit will reveal to you um, how you, you should be shaped and molded by the text. But, but the idea that this text can mean a thousand things to a thousand people is silly and it leads to the abuse of what's beautiful a, instead of letting the beauty shape us. You tracking with me? That, that's, we haven't even started the sermon yet. We're in trouble today. Okay. The context of this passage, all, the context of all passages matter. But the context of this one, especially since it's one of those that's been abused historically, you know where we've been, right? We're talking about in first Peter, we're talking about how we as Christians should live in an environment that's not persecuting us, but we kind of bother them, right? Like nobody's getting arrested or imprisoned or beaten, but we certainly are seen as an obstacle to the direction the predominant culture wants to go, Right? Uh, and so it's, it's more acidic than anything else. We're misrepresented more than we're persecuted. We, we are um, painted as, even with verses like this, is archaic and the root cause uh, of abuse and power in our day and age. And unfortunately, the church has earned some of that. But this passage sits in uh, really a longer section of 1 Peter that's talking about how you and I should live in an imperfect, broken, fallen world as Christians. And, and if you remember, the, the whole thrust of this section uh, has been how are we as believers to live under the authority of unbelievers, right? That's been three weeks now. Uh, and, and so this idea of how, is, how are we as believers meant to sit under the authority of unbelievers and do so in a way that doesn't betray that we're children of God, that we are disciples of Jesus Christ? How do we uh, like harness uh, our power into meekness so that we might reflect the beauty of the way of Jesus to the world. And so we said, uh, really all three weeks, we said the, the primary way we do that is to live lives of beauty and goodness. That, that you and I have been called into the moral law of God. Now, unfortunately, we live in a day where that might be called legalism. And, and yet, it's only legalism if you try to do it to get saved. It's not legalism if you submit to King Jesus because you are. You tracking with me? That, that's the tease out. God has a moral law and a moral plan for human flourishing, and he asks us, despite our compulsions, to submit to that so that the world might smell the aroma of Christ, that, that you and I might be a kind of a plausibility structure to the world where they see us, and they're like, I guess it doesn't have to be like this. We begin to reveal what's possible, redemption that our worst moment doesn't define us, but is actually redeemed and made whole, right? That, that's what we get to do in our marriages, in our parenting, with our money, in our friendships, deep, 
goodness that the world will either see as light and salt, the aroma of Christ, or it will be the stench of death as it brings conviction and confronts their own idolatry. And so week one, I want to pop up real quick before we get to this. Uh, he, he says in week one, which was several weeks ago for us, uh, chapter two, verses 13 through 70, that everyone should submit, right? How are you and I uh, to live in this beauty, in this goodness, in this boldness? What boldness looks like for us is that we go the path of Jesus and we submit as citizens. We're the best citizens we possibly can be. We don't ever obey laws that put us up and against the kingdom of God, but we're the best citizens imaginable. Everyone submit. That's how this started. It didn't start out like submission isn't a women's issue. You tracking with me? Like that's not the way it started. Like, like Peter and go, we need to talk about the ladies. That, that's not what he, he literally starts with going, everyone submit. And, and then he moves and he gives eight verses to servants. Right? Eight verses to servants, not slave servants. It's a, it's a kick up from slavery, but nowhere near the, the ruling elite. And they were marginalized and they were beaten and they were viewed uh, as property. And it was a tough deal to be a servant. He gives them eight verses. Here's what it looks like. And we talked about uh, for you and I, that, that probably parallels best with work. Like what does it look like to be a Christian at work when you uh, are persecuted or, or you suffer not because you're lazy, uh, right? But because, not because you're a jerk, but, but because you love Jesus. That just, you're like the best employee there and yet they hate you or you don't get the promotion or you don't get the raise or you don't because your love for Jesus, they see as an obstacle when all said and done to, to the modern utopian vision of what human flourishing looks like. And then we get, and this is all important, then you get six verses to wives, look at me, who are married to unbelieving husbands. This passage isn't a grid for Christian marriage. This passage is not a grid for Christian marriage. This passage is a grid for what happens when you become a Christian, ladies, and, and your husband does not. That this is how do we live faithfully as a daughter of King Jesus when our husband isn't interested. And then lastly, one verse for husbands. Now why? I think what's happening in this passage is he's going from least to greatest in regards to power and, and, and the ability to make things happen. Right, right. He starts with servants who had almost no power uh, and no ability to make anything happen. And then he moves to women and he gives them six verses, which we'll talk about here in a second. It was crazy that he addressed women at the level of their will. And, and then you get one for the man. Why? Because the man held all the power in pater familias. Right. And, and so that that's the context we find this. in. so what does it look like to be faithful to Jesus in a home where the spouse is an unbeliever. That's what this passage, that's the question that this passage is answering. Now, with that said, let, let's look at it. Let's pick it up in verse one. Likewise, now you should circle that word. Again, this is just, this is why we want you to know the Bible. It's not like schoolwork. It's like getting to know a, a lover, Right, like when I'm on a date with my wife and she's telling me uh, about her soul, I'm like, oh, this is so much work. No, it actually increases my delight to get to know who my wife is now because my wife's been 40 different women since we got married. Brothers, amen? <laughs> that is not the woman I married. She's a, a, a better version than the woman I married and I pray she would say the same about me. So on date night, I get to know the woman I'm married to. She probably shifted in the last couple of weeks and that, that's not drudgery. That, that's actually a lot of fun. I mean, that's how you should read the Bible, right? You're getting to know the lover of your soul. And that word likewise ties it back to what we've been talking about. Submission to ungodly, unjust leadership. And so likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart 
with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And don't think I don't know some of you are like, oh, no, uh, uh. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now, in Roman civilization, uh, the code, the law of the land, when it came to family uh, situations, was literally called, you can, you can look this up, I would encourage you, just go down the rabbit hole, right? It's, it's terrible, and it shows you the power of the gospel, is pater familias. And here's what pater familias stated. It stated that the, the man, the husband in a Roman household, had complete autocratic authority over the household until he was dead, so here's what that means. That means if you're 37 and your daddy was still alive, guess who ain't grown? Guess who can't make their own decisions? Guess who can't buy anything without daddy's permission still as a 37-year-old, right? And if you're like, I wish my dad would try. Well, let me keep going down the law, right? Under this system, the father had the power of life and death. There are a ton of examples historically where a father put to death his grown children for dishonoring and disrespecting him. Like this is the world that this is being written into. When a child was born, it was the father that decided whether or not to keep the baby. In fact, one of the reasons the early church exploded like it did is the church said, we'll take her. Oh, you don't want her? We'll take her. Like all those baby girls that the Romans were wanting to throw away and leave out on the lawn in exposure to death, it was the early church that said, we'll raise them. And honestly, uh, I haven't read this, but here I just do the math in my head. Um, my, my guess is 50 years later, you've got a lot of fine Christian girls at church, a lot of Roman boys without ladies. <laughs> See how the church grew? You know what I'm saying? Not missionary dating, though. Don't you do that. Now, um, <laughs> Here's another thing in, this is, is, is wild to me that this, this was what it was. So in Pater Familius, domestic abuse was viewed as not just acceptable, but the normative way to shape your wife into what she should be. Like you would spank your wife like you spanked your kids. You would beat your wife like you beat your kids. That This is the Roman world that this is being written into. The wife was expected to worship the same gods that her husband did. And if you want to even go a step further into Greek and Roman philosophy, you'll see that uh, women were on the social scale between slaves and men. They were still not considered fully human. They, they were human, like more human than slaves, but, but they're not fully human, right? They're not like real people. And, and this is what this, these 12 verses is being written into. So remember, likewise. Here, here's the command. He, he starts by saying what not to do, right? He, he starts by saying what not to do. He, he says here that, that they may be one. That, that's the hope, the hope of a, a Christian wife. And the way it had to play out then is probably somewhat different than many of our stories. If you're a, in a relationship where your spouse isn't a believer, where uh, the early church is flying. And so these women uh, came to know Christ uh, and, and they had been married uh, to a Roman man already that had already been worshiping other gods. So already you've got somebody who's all in. Like if a woman says yes to Jesus in this moment, she's not a cultural Christian. Those don't exist yet. This will get you killed. So this is a woman that says, Jesus is my all. The Holy Spirit has opened up her heart. And now what am I meant to do? Well, Peter says, listen, if you want to win your husband to Christ, Win him not with words, but with works. I, I want to say this and just trust that this is a safe space. I'll find out this week if it is. No one has ever been nagged into the kingdom of God. Ever. History of the Christian faith. No man has woke or tried to go to bed on Saturday night and heard, oh, I guess since it's, you know, since the time's changing, you're just going to sleep in in the morning. I guess, you know, there's basketball tournaments. I guess that's more important than raising our kids in the fear of the Lord and gone, you know what? I'm in. Never mind. I'll get up early and, and I'll, you, you don't nag someone into the kingdom of God. Did, did you know that the Bible says that it's better for a man to die in the desert than to live in the house with a contentious woman? 
That's in the Bible. Like the word of God sees a man just getting henpecked to death at every turn. And God says, yeah, man, um, <laughs> would probably be better if you just head to the desert. Should I bring my Nalgene bottle? I would not. I would just get on out in the desert and die there. It would be better. A man is not designed to respond in a healthy way to the consistent nagging of a woman. If you can nag him into doing it, it's begrudging, not legitimate, and not what you actually want, sis. Peter says, let him, one, let him be one without a word. And, and then he goes on, and there's this, this um, whole passage about don't let your external beauty be with braided hair and jewelries. And like I said, there have been some, some significant Pentecostal holiness that took that to heart. Um, but really what's happening here is that not only do, do you not win them with words or nagging them, you also don't win them by seducing them. Nobody's won to the kingdom via nagging and seduction. And, and again, this is a call to not manipulate. You live with an unbelieving man, don't manipulate. Don't, don't manipulate. So, so that's the don'ts, all right? Don't, don't nag, don't use sex as a weapon, don't, don't do that if you want to win him. You want him to consider, you want him to see beauty. You want him to be compelled by the God of the Bible. You want to pull him away from the worship of all these false gods and, and align with him in good design. Don't manipulate him. If he senses it, he'll resent you. If he's soft, then he'll cater to you, but not really mean it. It's not what you want, sis, is what Peter is saying here. So if that's not what we're supposed to do, what are we supposed to do? And I, and I love how he explains that, although we got to spend some time in four because I think four has been a, a verse twisted and, and used against women in an unhealthy way. Look, look back in verse two. They're not won by words, but by works as he sees your respectful and pure conduct. Respectful and pure conduct. Let me, let me give two things here. I think they're great principles for all of marriage, but especially if you're married to an unbelieving man. Two things. One, be an expert in his strengths. Be an expert in his strengths. Man, he might not know and love Jesus, but I guarantee you he's doing something that if you were just paying attention or weren't dialed into what he's not, you would see and you'd be able to speak to. There is a, I don't know how it happened to us, it's dumb, but listen, if you, if you think non-believers can't be happy and have good marriages and do good things, I don't know what to tell you, but that's kind of like a, like a line that I hear all the time. So, so if you've got an unbelieving man, rather than being fixated on, he's not a believer in Jesus, what I want most is for him to love Jesus, but, but he doesn't love Jesus, and gosh, now he's not raising our kids like he should love Jesus, not spending our money like he should love Jesus, and all, you're just hyper-focused on that. that, that's not pure, and it is disrespectful. What does it look like for you to just be an expert in his strengths? To, to be able to say to him, and I love the way you provide for our family, I see you grinding like you are. What does it look like for you to come aside and, and, and support him and work for his good? To say, I, I see you're trying to knock this out. How can I help you? Is there a way that I can live? A, I, are there ways that I can set up our home that, that helps you flourish the way that I see you grinding towards? I love the, the way you spend time with our son and, and the way you're loving our I just love when you, I love when you take the ownership to do that. that that's showing respect. That, that's being pure of heart, it will also, ladies, and I'm, I'm just going to, we got to go. I'm going to get on your men here in a second, but for now, it's us, sis. This also will protect you when your dumb friends badmouth him. Hmm? Like, you must be careful if your husband's an unbeliever at what women you let into your life and let speak to you about your husband. Like you must not let them sow distrust and frustration into your heart. There'll be enough there as it is. You don't need help with that. In fact, in Song of Solomon, uh, Solomon and his wife, they're in this huge fight and, and, and she's running out looking for him. Like he had to leave the house, man. He was getting hot headed, so he left the house and she's looking all over and she runs into her girls. 
And so she asked her girls, right, margarita night. She's like, hey, have you seen, my, I mean, not margarita, we're at church, um, iced tea night. And, and she uh, like runs and, and she finds her girls and she's like, have you been seen, have you been seen, have you seen my beloved uh, among uh, the virgins of the palace? And they're like, why would you look for him? Look how fine you are. You can do better than that. I mean, that's literally what they say to her. That's modernized. But, and then uh, like she responds with this long list of his strengths. Things that'll never be said about me. Your legs are like bronze. Your chest like alabaster. Like Lawrence just got to go. I mean, he's tall and fun. Uh, you know, he's funny. He's got a great sense of humor, right? That's all I'll get. But uh, like he's driven. He's a hard worker. He's so sweet. He's kind of cute in a weird way. Uh, but, but not Solomon. Solomon gets bronzed thighs with an abdomen chiseled by the hand of God. And, and so like how does she refute the hymns? She refutes the hens with the strengths of her husband. She's an expert in the strength of her husband. You have an unbelieving husband, get a PhD in what he's good at. And then tell him he's good at it. All right? That, that is pure. That is respectful. And, and then look at verse 4. We've got to look at verse 4 because I think this is the bully text, and I want to show you why it shouldn't be. Verse 4. But let your adorning... Be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. This verse in no way says women should just be quiet and deal with their unbelieving husbands. It's not what that says. Where's your effort? You put it in its context. Where are you spending your time? Where are you spending your effort? It's not in trying to look fine enough to woo him into the kingdom. It's a cultivation of the peace of God in our hearts that gives us confidence that the arms of the Lord are not too short to save. We don't need nor want a, a quiet woman who has nothing to say. I'm telling you. Like, I can't be all that God wants me to be without Lauren having some strength and a spine. Like, if she's never willing to say, you know I love you, you know I'm your biggest fan, buddy, th this is a gap. I love you, but this is a gap. Like, who else is going to see it? You? You don't live with me. You don't see me in my weakest moments. Lauren sees me in my weakest moments. If she brings to me respectfully and out of a pure heart, a, a critique, God, I want that. I need that. Iron sharpens iron is not a passage about brotherhood. It's a passage about how we're shaped and formed. This is, you have an unbelieving husband, give a lot of space to cultivating a heart, cultivating a heart that sees Christ as exalted and on his throne. That, that sees him as the one who is able to save. That, that sees the long game of God breaking through in your husband's life. It's not manipulative. It's not nagging. It's not seducing. It, it's a gentle and quiet spirit that's been cultivated that says, I trust you, God. I trust you. We good? Okay. Now, from there, we've got this this thing in five and six that, that I have got a billion questions about over the years. Even when I was going to, when I announced we're preaching first Peter, I got maybe, you know, several emails going, what are you doing about this? Slido on our member meeting. What are you going to do about this? That this passage in five and six is about God taking women uh, who are married to unbelievers and putting them right into the heart of the redemptive story of God redeeming all humankind. Let me, let me show you how that happens. He, he mentions, hey, women who did that are like women, holy women of old, like Abraham and Sarah. Now that's, that's royalty. That, that's Christian royalty. You read your Bible. You study your Bible. You find out how many times it's the God of Abraham. You, you find out how many times it's Abraham and Sarah. This is, we don't have anything like this. Right? In our society, right? You know, it used to be uh, Brad and, and Angelina or Brad and Jen before that. Now I think it's Tom and Zendaya or whatever. I, I can't keep up. There's nothing quite like this royalty. This is the family that ushers in the promise that spreads the gospel to the ends of the earth. So she, he's saying to these women, you're not outside the family you're in. 
You're not, you're right in the heart of what it means to belong to the mission of God. There's only one place in the entirety of the Old Testament where Sarah calls Abraham Lord. And it's found in Genesis 18. The story is, it's a theophany. Um, These three men show up at uh, Abraham's tent. Abraham knows they're divine. So he falls down to worship him and he says to Sarah, hey, will you uh, make some cakes for these brothers? And then he has a calf killed and and, uh, I'm assuming it's Akaushi, I could be wrong. Uh, And then uh, has it seared and put out and wine and they feast. And one of them says, many theologians believe this is the trinity in physical form, which is just kind of cool to think about a theophany that way. And one of them says to Abraham, I'll be back this time next year and the child of promise will be here, right? And, and Sarah, she like doing that thing, right? She's just like listening. She ain't nosy, she's just curious. And, and so she's, she's like listening and she hears this and hears her response. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Now, now that word pleasure, she's not saying, oh, you're old and I'm old. We're supposed to have sex. That's not what's happening. The pleasure of having a baby and raising a baby. Some of her heart has been broken for her whole life. And she's like, look, man, I, I've gone through menopause. I, I am hot right now. <laughs> and this brother, no, my Lord, you're older than me. Right? It's kind of this playful partnership that you can see happening in this passage where she calls him my Lord. It's the only place she calls Abraham my Lord. But you can see even now the ground of mutual submission in playful submission inside the marriage. And then he moves from here to husbands who get one verse. But it's a verse that like punches you in the head and sweeps your leg and drops an elbow on you. So let's look at it. <laughs> likewise, husband. So there, there's likewise again. So what does this mean? This means a husband who is married to an unbelieving wife. Now in this one verse, it's the man who has come to know Jesus and the woman who's worshiping the Roman gods. We good? All right. With that said, Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women, to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, the word vessel most often in the New Testament uh, is used to refer to our physical bodies. You, You might remember we have these treasures in jars of clay, vessels of clay. It's speaking of our physical body, our um, finiteness, the fact that we grow old and turn to dust, that we're easily breakable, that we're not hard to kill. That's what's in view here. And then if you take this, where other uh, verses address husband and wife submission, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, Colossians 3, 18 through 19, what you're seeing in this passage is a warning to husbands to refrain from the physical dishonor of their wives. Now remember, in the, in the, the, the pater familia, how do you get your wife to do what you want? Well, you beat her into submission. That that's what you do. Completely legal and ordinary. The advice culture would give you is, oh, she, she's not worshiping Jesus? You have to give her a whipping. Drag her to church. That, I'm telling you, we, because the gospel's done its work to even think like that, feels like a billion years ago, and yet it was this seed going in the ground that addressed the woman at the level of her will. We even talk about that. Six verses talking to a woman's will in the Bible in this moment of human history. Listen, guys, that's the seed that went in the ground. Jesus talks about the kingdom like a seed that's buried, and as it grows, it turns into a tree so big that the birds of the air roost in its branches. First wave feminism is born of those who love the word of God and the kingdom. Now the third wave, the third wave lost its mind, but the first wave was a beautifully, biblically wrought view of human flourishing that honored women as whole people, that longed to hear their voice, that allowed them to lead and live into their gifts, and in no way brutalized or saw them as property. And so here Peter says, Don't touch her. You consider her, he goes three ways. One, you you don't physically bully her. 
You don't use your strength against her. You don't use your size against her. And, and then he turns to the positive and says, for she is your heir. She is an heir with you. She, she is not a belonging that you have. Uh, she is not your property. She is not some plaything for your pleasure. She is a daughter of the king. And you better not put your hands on her because if you put your hands on her, God's not going to hear your prayers. I mean, you want to know how serious God is about protecting his daughters? You bully up your wife. You use your size to intimidate. You use your voice and your strength to corner and to silence. God's like, all right, boom, you're out. Like, just cut you off. So you're like, God, I just, I so want my business to, and I want my kids to, and I'd love it if you would. And God's like, I don't hear nothing from you. You ain't in submission to me. You're not in submission to the government. You're not in submission to anybody. You're, you're your own God. And I'm not listening until you repent. This is what he says. To, That's your heir with you. Like, that, that's, your, that's your partner. Uh, that's who I gave you for your own flourishing. Before sin entered the world, God saw the man and said, that ain't good. It is not good that the man should be alone and he gives him a partner, a helper, a co-laborer. So that in God's good design, Lauren has been given to me for my good. And the friction that can flare between the two of us is about our good if we'll position ourselves under God, gladly submitting to him with an understanding of foundational mutual submission within the marriage where I have been given the command to lead us in a way where she feels seen, included, and a part of our story that God's given to us. So, so husbands, uh, unbelieving husbands that are here, and let, well, let me say, I want to say this, because if one of the reasons I wanted to highlight some of the things that I'm highlighting is if you're a woman in a marriage, in a dating relationship, in a, where you're being physically abused, intimidated, manipulated, cornered, you do not owe that man submission. You're not biblically bound to that man in submission. He has forfeited what is due him by his own lack of submission to the king of glory and to the laws of the land. And let me be, maybe this is the first pastor I ever say that, let me be the one that says, you should leave and we'll help you if you need help. You are not, you are not locked in to being beat up and bullied. You're just not. That's not what this text is doing. It's not what this text means. In the same way that we obey and we are the best citizens we can possibly be until the government makes it impossible. In the same way we're the best worker we possibly can be until our workplace makes it impossible. We are the best spouse that we can possibly be, respect, honor, uh, all of those pieces there, seeing each other as co-heirs until it becomes impossible. And the moment he hits you or uses his strength to overpower you or to take from you um, anything sexual, that that's, that's the green light to get help. And we will not be a church that participates in that kind of bullying. And, and so I, I know I might be triggering all sorts of things right now. You, you can uh, email us this week. You, you're not going to deal with a man. I'm going to connect you very quickly uh, to Summer or Mari or somebody like that, a woman who can come alongside of you and begin to walk with you. If marriage is just difficult, that's not what I'm talking about. Marriage is difficult. There are seasons in life where every marriage is difficult. Anybody married in here going, yeah, we've been through that season. Get them up higher. I know we're Baptist, but come on, help the people. <laughs> I don't, I don't like how quick and strong my wife's hand was, but yes, th this is what it is. So I'm not saying if your marriage is difficult, you might be going through a season where it's difficult, where you're missing each other, where you're not connecting in a way that would be helpful. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you have been physically harmed or you are afraid frequently for yourself, that, that's, not, that, that's not what the Bible has in view here. And if you ever were taught or heard that that is, I'm so sorry. It's absurd. It's absurd. Now, he moves then from the husband. So remember, we went everyone. We went government. We went servants. We went households. And now he's back to everyone. He kind of closes the sandwich with these 
words. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. So I want to, again, we're talking about goodness again. We're talking about beauty. We're, we're popping up. We're, we're going, finally, all of you. And, and then he begins to talk about this relationship, not only that we'll have with the world around us, but that we'll have with one another. Unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Now, why is that possible? He, here's what I think. Look at it. Like, if you're a Christian, we know what it's like to be redeemed by Jesus out of our nonsense. And then, stay with me, we also know how much slower sanctification is than we want it to be. Anybody wish they were a little bit further along than they are? Anybody thought they would be further along than they are at this point? Yeah, oh my gosh, yes. And yet, here we are. So, so when I see you, like why is the word sympathy here? Well, why is sympathy in this passage about goodness and flourishing? Well, because as Christians, we become this counterculture because I can look at you where you are and know you're in the middle of your story. Gosh, you might be at the beginning of your story and I can look at you and go, man, I've been there. I've had to wrestle with compulsions. I didn't quite have victory. over. I had blind spots. I needed somebody to point out to me. I remember how discombobulating it was when someone pointed out a blind spot to me. Like, where else are you going to get that? In, in, a, in a covenant of love where we're going, we see that you're on the road. We, we understand that you, man, you, you're in a bit of a desert right now. We love you. Let, let's keep going. Let, let's get there. And, and then I love, not only are we meant, uh, do we know, we know what progressive sanctification, we know what it's like to be redeemed, but I'm, I'm going to, again, he, he takes this and he says, don't, don't do what the world does. Let's not fight like they fight. Don't revile when you're reviled. Don't, don't hate when you're hate. But he says, bless. We've talked a lot about this. Uh, so the last couple of weeks, so let me just mind you, I'm going to give you, here's some homework. It's fun. I promise it's fun. I want you to every day this next week, bless two people. That's all you gotta do. You've gotta dial in and bless somebody. I ain't talking about being weird. You don't need to show up with some oil. Just like, what would it be like for you to show up at work and old Dave in accounting, if your name's Dave and you're an accountant, maybe that's prophetic. And, and you go up to Dave in accounting because you wanna be this kind of person and you're like, Dave, those spreadsheets, bro. We can do what we do because you do what you do. Thank you. Like, how could we see rightly if you didn't do this tedious, hard work? Thank you, Dave. Nobody loves Dave, the accountant. Like, what's that going to do to him? And then how is he going to see you? Or, or what about this one? Um, as a parent, our eyes are drawn to the gap between where our kids are and where we would hope they would be, right? Uh, like you want so much or you want them to learn the easy way instead of the hard way. But almost all of our kids choose to learn the hard way. What if we said, I'm going to be an expert on their strengths and I'm going to point out in them what I see that they're doing well, rather than being such an expert and how far they have to go. Well, what happens if you just twice a day, seven days a week, you just bless somebody. And this says blessing will be returned to you. So we don't revile when we're reviled, we bless. And so what does it look like to develop the habit of blessing? I'm telling you, this could turn the world on its head because who does that anymore? At work, at home, at Starbucks, at Edison, at you name it. I'm two people today. I'm fine and I'm a blessing. So this morning I wrote a little note on Lauren's coffee and stuck it on her cup. And so I got one left coming for one of you suckers probably after this service. So you'll know, <laughs> right? And then from there, verse 10, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers is not a threat. It is a motivating force of being delighted in. You know when you look at your kids when they're little and they start to perform? 
Maybe I've just got that kind of kid, but uh, like, you know, they would dance or show you, hey, look, hey, uh, like that's, th- this passage, like he's looking at us, he's delighting in us, and so let's do good. Let- let's show off. Uh, let's show him that we love him and that his kingdom is good and that we want to project goodness to the world because we've experienced his goodness in Christ. All of this is purchased in surrender. Submission. Everyone, everyone sandwich. So I wonder, here's here's what I believe. All of us have authority issues. You get the right people telling us to do something and we'll buck against it. We all do. What does it look like in regards to our relationship with the God of the universe? To lay everything down, like full on white flag, no matter what it is, it's yours. I wonder how many of you are holding on to something. How many, maybe husbands that have come today, maybe even to kind of get her to stop nagging you. And, and yet today you heard the word and maybe for the first time are ready to say yes to him. Or maybe you, you've been digging in your heels this last month as you felt the Holy Spirit kind of beckoning you towards full surrender to Jesus, full submission to Jesus. Maybe you grew up in church but never really said yes and you're just kind of this moral church attender rather than one who delights in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, I want to invite you in to surrender today. Full surrender. I'm a bad king. You're a great king. I'm a terrible God. You're a great God. I'm laying my yes down. Full flag surrender. I'm yours. Some of you married to unbelievers need to recommit to living this way and maybe even repent in some ways. You've been nagging your husband's face off. It's a good thing to go home and go, I need you to forgive me. Here's what the word of God says. I'm sorry, I should be an expert in your strengths. If you've tried to strong arm or, or bully your bride, you need to repent quickly. The Lord won't hear you until you do. What does it look like to reflect the beauty and goodness of God in the world you and I are in? I'm going to pray for us. We'll um, celebrate some baptisms. And I want to just say, if today's that day that you're like, I'm, I'm on white flag up, I'm finally, I'm in. Man, you can go to the back. We'll have men and women back there. They'll pray with you, encourage you, hear from you. And then, man, we got T-shirts and towels if, if you want to celebrate new life with us today. But for now, let me bless you. Father, bless these men and women. So much here that I can't see, but you can see. Pray for courage and strength. pray for my sisters. It ought not be this way. Where they should be loved and respected and protected and cherished. Several for their whole lives have felt beat up and excluded and silenced. And I I just pray you minister to the deep part of their souls today. And Father, there's some men here that deeply long for their wives to love you and, and, and come with them in a life of adventure serving you. And yet there's been some wounds. There's been some hurt. There's been some, will you heal? Will you grant salvation today? Will you move in power today? We need you. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.